Whatever. Okay. Be my honor. You can look here, please, one more second. Okay. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Mr. Peter Mecca on Monday, March 23rd at 0830 hours, and we are located in the Atlanta History Center, Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we talk about your experiences in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information about you, when and where you were born, your family, and your age when you went to Vietnam. How old were you when you went to Vietnam? Just turned 19. Who were your family members? I had a mother and father, no fiance or girlfriend at that time. Uh, once I got into the military, I knew I was Vietnam bound, and I didn't want to put anyone through that. I have two sisters, Mary Nell and Joyce, and my extended family in Memphis, Tennessee are probably into the dozens, as my extended family in Pennsylvania, my Italian relatives in Dunmore, Pennsylvania. What was your hometown? Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you entered the military? I was very patriotic. Uh, I wanted to do my duty. I know my father had served in World War II. He flew over the hump, uh, the Himalayan mountain range. Uh, he was very patriotic. I grew up that way. My country was in a war. It was my turn to do my duty and serve my country. So far as if we were winning or what we were doing, I considered that we were doing the right thing. I supported the war. And once I got there, I knew things were a little bit different than I thought, but um, I still served and I stayed there too. You were enlisted. I was enlisted. Uh, were you drafted or did you volunteer? No, I volunteered. I, I had, the Army had a program at that time where you could take your physical to qualify for chopper school. I took the physical. And they said, son, uh, and I already flew small aircraft. They said, son, we can't use you as a chopper pilot because you, have, you don't have 20-20. At the time, you had to have 20-20. And I had a bad right eye. And they said, but we can put you in a chopper. And I said, well, what as? And they said, a door gutter. And I said, I think the Air Force recruiting station is right down the hallway. So I joined the Air Force, spent four years there. If you volunteered, why? Volunteer for Vietnam? Yeah. Mean? Uh, I was in the military. I knew I was going to get out and finish my college education. I served one year down at McCoy Air Force Base in intelligence, flying on B-52s. I drew the, uh, uh, what they call the radar prediction, because B-52s, when they went to Russia, say, they could no longer fly high because the SAMs could reach them. They had to go low, down on the deck, about 800 feet from the ground, and that will shake your teeth out in a B-52. But a radar scope, if you're flying high and look at a radar scope, and you've probably done this, you can pick up towns and rivers and the terrain. If you're down on the deck, the radar scope looks like spaghetti. There is a certain way, using the topography of a map, that you can draw a radar prediction of what the scope is going to look at. So I had to fly with the radar navigator so that he could critique my work, and that, that was great fun. I really enjoyed flying on B-52s, okay? From there, I got my orders for NKP. Now, once I got to the war zone, I was going to stay there for the duration of my enlistment. Uh, quite frankly, I, I loved the military, I loved the Air Force, but when you had an operational readiness inspection and you couldn't put a piece of trash into a trash can because the inspectors would say, oh, it's dirty, uh, that was enough of that, okay? <laughs> so I knew I was going to, to uh, get out, finish my education. That's why I stayed in Vietnam. Describe the training you received before going to Vietnam. Good training. Uh, I went to Lowry Air Force Base for, I think, 18 weeks. Uh, that was for the intelligence school. Uh, it was surprising that there were foreign officers there. I didn't expect that. They were from uh, Lebanon, Egypt, Israel. They would all gather in the hallways and talk. And then if you recall, the uh, 67 conflict between Israel and, and the Arabs, the next morning, the lobby was cleared out. <laughs> all right. uh, it is said, I didn't see them, but they said that they went to the airport to fly home 
to go to war against each other, and they were shaking hands and wishing everybody the best of luck. Okay, but the intelligence school was thorough. It was good. I learned a lot. Um, the first thing I was taught, I have remembered for the rest of my life, and that is, don't believe in anything you read, and only half of what you see. And none of what you hear. And none of what you hear. <laughs> and that goes for the internet and Facebook too. Yes. Well, <laughs> when, when did you go to Vietnam? After serving 18 months at NKP in Thailand uh, as part of a project interdicting Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, I left there after 18 months, went to Vietnam in September of 69, and left in September of 1970. What were your first impressions on arriving in Vietnam? <clears throat> That's a story into itself. I enjoyed the people in Thailand. I enjoyed the culture. I uh, had a good time there. When I arrived at NKP in Thailand, it was like landing on a World War II Pacific Island. Uh, it was cut out of the middle of the jungle. It was very primitive. We had no jet fighters. It was all prop-driven aircraft, some rescue helicopters, and we had the old A-26 twin-engine bomber from World War II. I tried my best to get on one of those bombers, but they wouldn't let me. Uh, they finally pulled them out of service because they had a little problem with the wings falling off. Okay? So <clears throat> when I volunteered for Vietnam to serve my last year in the Air Force, I got my orders. The night before, I went and played poker all night long. It was late catching the C-130. And I said, shoot. I'm in the terminal. I put my duffel bag down wait for the next C-130 coming through to take me to Tonsonute. And the general I worked for, General Willie McBride, walked through the terminal. I knew he was doing that because everybody was tit hut. All right, so I got up and he said, Mecca, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, uh, sir, I'm on my way to Vietnam, but I missed my flight, okay? I was, he said, why? And I said, well, sir, I was up all night playing poker. And he said, Sergeant, I'm not talking about that. Why are you going to Vietnam? And I said, I volunteered. Well, don't you have family back home? Yes, sir, I just came back from leave. And he said, I'll tell you what, if, where are you going? I said, Tonson New. He said, uh, you ride with me. I said, great, okay. So I thought he was going to get on C-130 or something like that. Well, there he walks out to his private Learjet, okay. That's the only jets we had. We had one jet for uh, General uh, William McBride, and we had a Learjet for the South East Asia Director of IBM, Mr. Durango, okay? So there I am, I board this aircraft, a Learjet, with a one-star general. It's only the general and his pilot, and I'm by myself in the cabin. We take off and we're headed for Vietnam, okay, in a Learjet. General McBride came back probably halfway into the flight and sat down and talked to me like he was my daddy. And I remember that for the rest of my life. He asked me what I wanted to do, what I thought about the war. He thanked me for my job at our site. And he said, well, I got to go land now. Okay, I got to get my flight time in. I said, okay. I remember that. But we landed at Tonson Newt. And of course, the Learjet outpaced the C-130 I was supposed to ride. <laughs> we taxied up. <clears throat> and we pulled up alongside the C-130, okay? We had got there about the same time. So I'm deplaning. Joe McBride, I salute him, but he shook my hand, okay? Now I had some buddies getting off that C-130, and they looked over at me, and they saw me shaking hands with a one-star general, okay? And I could see the expression in her face like, Okay, here's a sergeant riding into Vietnam on a Learjet, and he's shaking hands with a one-star general. What's going on here? <laughs> they didn't talk to me for like two to three weeks. And I finally lassoed one of them. I said, what's wrong with you guys? You won't even talk to me. And they said, you're not kidding us anymore, okay? You have to be CIA. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got them straight, though. But that's how I got to Vietnam. I went on a Learjet. What were your initial duties? In Vietnam, they put me in charge of the 460 attack recon wings planning and uh, uh, figuring the coordinates for the mission. Okay, planning, plotting. By, by the then, mission. you're a sergeant. 
Yeah, well, yes, sir. They were having problems. When I got there, the colonel took me aside and said, Mecca, we got a problem here, and I need you to straighten it out. We're having three to four mistakes a month. We've already lost two pilots this past year. See what you can do. And I said, okay, fine. It was not hard to find out the problem. The guys were, some of them were on drugs, a couple of them were out, they would play hooky and go downtown to Tudo Street or wherever they wanted to go. And I told the colonel, I said, I got a clean house. I need the pick of the crop coming in from the states. And he said, okay. And I really upset the company commander on that one because he usually got the cream of the crop for his duties. I got the cream of the crop. I got like four college graduates coming in who were enlisted and one guy just considered really smart from his uh, bio. Uh, I took those guys, trained them, and they had hoped that I'd get the mistakes down to one or two a month. In the 12 months I was in Vietnam, we had no mistakes, zero. And that included the Cambodian invasion. Okay? We only lost one pilot, and that was because he was on the mission and his plane disintegrated in the air, and we don't know where. Mm -hmm. Where were you based in Vietnam? In Vietnam, Tan Son Nut, Saigon, Vietnam. What was the daily routine for you? The nightly routine? Or nightly. <laughs> I would go to work, it's about 12, 13 hour shift. I would go there, like I say, we planned and plotted using maps. We did a mosaic. We plotted the course for the pilots, put the coordinates down there, uh, if we thought there was going to be any any, any aircraft fire, we, we covered that from the intelligence. They would brief us on that. Uh, we would probably plan and plot 40 or 50 missions a night. Uh, I put in a system of checks and balances. I trained the guys how to do it. And then when they finished plotting the mission, they gave me the maps, and I went over every map to be sure it was correct. I knew the pilots' lives were in my hands, so I was not going to send them to the wrong place. What were your living conditions like? <laughs> Don't tell the Marines, okay? <laughs> Air Force usually had it pretty nice, okay? In Thailand, I had a nice barracks, uh, and at Tan Son Nut, we had a nice barracks. It was a double floor, you know, two floor barracks. Uh, of course, no air conditioning, but uh, for Vietnam, I, I'm not going to complain. I had too many buddies out there in the field. To no air conditioning. I know it's it was pretty cruel, you know. <laughs> uh, what issues, events, or responsibilities consumed most of your time? I think you just laid that out. I, I, that's pretty much what I did in Thailand. It was a little bit different. We were interdicted the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and that could change in a heartbeat. Um, you may know about the sensor program. We drop acoustic and seismic sensors along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That was interesting work. I know that one time, uh, one thing sticks out in my mind about that. One of the seismic sensors was going off, and we could not understand what it was, okay? Then we had the acoustic center. It started going off, and we could not understand what it was. It was a set, we knew water buffaloes, we knew when somebody walked by, we knew when a truck passed, if there was a tank over there, we knew it. <clears throat> we could tell foot soldiers, we could tell when a water buffalo walked by, okay? We were that good. This was just, <clears throat> we didn't know. We sent a commando team in there from the 5th, 6th uh, commando wing in NKP, and they came back, <clears throat> they made it back fine, but they were just, they were laughing their fannies off. What the North Vietnamese had done they had found the acoustic center, okay, and the seismic sen sensor, and they were together. That's, that's unusual, but they were fairly close together. And as the trucks went by, and, and the bicycles, and all the supply chain, they had lined up their soldiers, and they were taking turns urinating on our sensors. <laughs> and that is exactly the sound that we were picking up. So <clears throat> somewhere in the archives, it is marked down, <clears throat> if you hear this sound, that is a common soldier pissing on a sensor. <laughs> <laughs> what were your impressions of the Vietnamese people initially and by the end of your tour? I like the Vietnamese people. Uh, I know that our barbers were probably Viet Cong. <clears throat> I know that some of the people I talked to were probably Viet Cong. Uh, 
or Viet Cong sympathizers. They were in a tough situation. They've been at war for 2,000 years. Uh, they had to kick Chinese out after 2,000 years of rule. And six times. Yeah. They had the French. And then we came in. I think what we were doing was honorable. I think we wanted to do the right thing. But in the end, it was up to the Vietnamese people to decide what they wanted. Uh, I know the communist regime is not good. It's tough. I do not know if we had won that war, and we had two opportunities to do that in 68 and 72. Had we won that war, I do not know what we would have won. We may have just delayed the inevitable. So that's for the politicians to figure out, I guess. Describe your friendships with and your impressions of your fellow airmen. Excellent. Um, there were some loose cannons in all branches of the service. Uh, we had to root them out, call them out. And the ones that I worked with or had to work for were superior. Uh, good guys, uh, they're your brothers. Did you form friendships with men or women from different racial or social backgrounds during your time in Vietnam that you might not ever have had in civilian life? No. Now, that may sound strange, but I, I'm not going to smooth this over. At that time, the race relations were not good, even in Vietnam. There were better race relations out there in the elements with the Marines and the Army because when it came down to the fighting, you had to rely on that man next to you. When you're fairly secure at a military base during the Vietnam War, there was the issue of race. That was a tough time in our country. The Civil Rights Movement was in full swing and there were not any fights or anything like that. But usually if you were talking to like an African American, you got into an argument, okay? Mm. But there was no uh, real animosity or fights or anything like that. We were trying to debate the issue and talk about it, but we did not integrate. And that's, a, that's, that's sad, that is sad. And Joe, in my writings, I have Everybody now knows about the Tuskegee Airmen from World War II, the African-American pilots. In some of my speeches and lectures and presentations at the schools, I would even ask the teachers and the students, you know about the T Tuskegee Airmen? Oh yeah, we know about them. Okay, well tell me about the Montford Point Marines. You know, Nobody ever what's heard that? of them. Okay, that was our black Marines in World War II. Now why don't our school children know that? Okay, then I say, okay, what about the Triple Nickels? What about the 555th? Well, what's that, okay? That was our black paratroopers in World War II. There is a history there that is still not taught, and it should be. What were your emotions at that time? In Vietnam? Yeah. <clears throat> My emotion ran the gauntlet for two and a half years. From 18 months planning plotting missions uh, over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and also seeing some of the results of our targeting in North Vietnam, then going to Vietnam and to see what we were doing in 1970, I was supportive of the war, but so far as my emotions, I could not understand why we were bombing dirt along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the Dragon's Jaw and the Paul Dahmer Bridge in Hanoi were not being hit, okay? If you're going to interdict, interdict. If you're going to fight a war, fight it. We could send four F-4s out on the trail, bomb dirt, waste about a quarter million dollars worth of ordnance. By the time the F-4s got back to Udon or, or Uban, the holes were already filled in by, by the uh, coolies. Um, I didn't like that phase of the war. Uh, I was there for the Cambodian invasion. That was successful so far as what we wanted to do, but again, that was limited in nature. I did not like the fact that we said we weren't in Laos, we weren't in Cambodia, we weren't doing anything there. Those are neutral countries. We knew they weren't neutral. The North Vietnamese knew they weren't neutral. The Russians knew they weren't neutral. The Chinese knew they weren't neutral. They knew a war was going on there. I think the only people that didn't know about the war in those two countries were the American people. 
What's your most vivid memory of Vietnam, your service there? My most vivid memory was basically something that almost ruined my Air Force career. And that's why I had to get out and get my education to try to go back in as an officer. There was a Jolly Green shot down. And there was American bodies laying all over the field. We couldn't recover them. It was in Laos, near Tech Pone. You remember Tech Pone? I know Tech Pone. Oh, Tech Pone. Um, and a chief master sergeant and another airman were making fun of the guys, that they looked like little dolls down there, and they were laughing about it. Oh. And I spoke up in, to the chief master sergeant, and I dropped F-bomb probably once too often in front of his face, and I got a bad write-up that pretty effectively ended my career, okay? I, I cannot tolerate that. that. That was the worst thing. Were there other incidents? Yeah, okay? But for me, that right there, for someone of, of that rank to be making fun of our boys laying in the dirt, uh -uh. That, that was too much. Describe for me the best day you had during your Vietnam tour. There were two and a half years of good days because I came home. Okay. Good days, I, when, when you're successful, when you do a good job. Um, I know that I went home, home. <laughs> when I got off work, I could either go to the club and get a cold beer or whatever. I'd go sleep. It didn't matter to me. But when you did that, to me, it was a personal thing, and I had to know that I had done the best job I could. Because if I screwed up, it was a possibility that people died. And I required myself to be tough, and I wanted my men under me to be tough. They had to do the right thing. So I went to the barracks and got off work knowing that we had done our best. The best day is, is when you know you gave it your best shot and I will pat myself on the back for that. I did my job. Describe for me the worst day you had during your Vietnam tour. I played uh, basketball with a young captain at Tonson Newt. Uh, we weren't very good basketball players, but we had a lot of fun. And he took off the um, next morning for a mission, didn't come back, mm. okay? It was just because I knew him. And, in the, and as you know, in the Army, Marines, you're out there in the field and you see your buddies when they get hit, when they get wounded, when they die, when they're wrapped up in that poncho. That is very emotional. That's a PTS event right there. But in the Air Force, it is different, unless you're in rescue uh, or something like that. The pilots take off and they just don't come back. It's sort of like, well, they went home and maybe they did go home, okay? Uh, it's a different roller coaster in the Air Force. And unless you're airborne, like on that B-52, you're with a team and you know that you can go down with that team. But when you go down, you uh, uh, live in fame and go down in flame, you just don't go back. And people don't normally see what a down pilot went through. Did he get out? Did he parachute out? Uh, I just did an interview with a young lady, uh, her brother, uh, Jones, Captain Jones was a flight surgeon and he was just getting airtime and he was aboard the last F-4 Air Force plane that went down in Vietnam and he's still MIA to this day mm -hmm. and that is, that, that's a tough way. That, that's that a tough, tough way. How much contact, if any, did you have with our allies? By that, I, I don't You mean, mean other than the Vietnamese Officers other Club? Other than the Vietnamese <laughs> Officers Club. <laughs> so you've been there once. <laughs> uh, a lot of contact in Thailand, but it was more social than anything. Once I got to Vietnam, I hardly had any contact with the Vietnamese. What about the others, the Koreans, Thais, Filipinos, The Aussies? Thais, the Filipinos, a little bit. Uh, the rocks, I never dealt with the rocks from South Korea. Wish I did. Uh, I heard they were pretty tough hombres. Yeah, okay. They were. Actually, I, I didn't really have that much contact with the Vietnamese in Vietnam. Except Not in with Saigon. The Arvin. Except in Saigon. Oh, well, there's Arvin, the white mice. 
okay, the, the police. Yeah. In Saigon, yeah, you had a lot of contact with the Vietnamese, but no forming relationships. I, I met a lot, talked a lot, but I could not give you one of their names today. Yeah. How much contact did you have with your family back home? Good contacts. My sisters kept in touch. They wrote me quite a bit. I got a letter from my mother about every two or three days. It's usually about something she cooked or something, but it was nice to hear from home. And they were very good about that. My father, uh, great guy, I loved him to death, but he was not much of a writer. I was lucky to get a letter from him once a month, okay? <laughs> but he, uh, just a great man, okay? But I had, I had good support from my home front. How did you communicate? Purely by letter, or letter. did you go on Mars, or? No, no. it was all a snail mail. How much news did you receive about the war from home? They kept me briefed pretty good about that, and we knew what was going on. You had new, the cherries would come in, the new guys, and they would tell you what's going on. Um, I didn't like what was going on. I knew that the war had reached a critical point, that we were probably going to lose that thing. Uh, I don't know how I felt about still wasting guys over there. And that's what it came to in the end. We were wasting people. We took ground and then gave it back up. Okay, we just, you don't take the high ground and then abandon it for the troops, I mean, the enemy troops next day. What was going on in the country? I felt a little bit embarrassed about it. I felt um, disrespected. I felt like they weren't supporting us. Um, when I got home, I never did join any anti-war movement, I can tell you that. I think the college students of that era, where they may have had a good idea, it is the same kind of reaction that I'm seeing today among the college students. We don't have to get into that. When when did you return home? September 1970. What would, describe what that was like. Good. From beginning to end. Well, taking the Freedom Bird out of Vietnam was a big deal. I mean, we couldn't wait to get off the ground. Okay, we got airborne 20,000 feet before we started celebrating because we knew uh, the Congress could probably hit us uh, with rockets or something, but. It was great. We had a good time coming back. Um, I think maybe after some celebrations, a couple of drinks, we all settled down and had our peaceful moments knowing that, hey, we made it, we're going home, okay? Uh, anxious to see our family. Of course, the pilot always pulled this stuff about, all right, we, we got MiG-21s out on our side and we're gonna have to land over in China. We've been diverted over there and everybody's going, oh, yeah. And of course, that was a joke. Uh, yeah. um, landed in, it was interesting, we uh, landed in Anchorage. Refuel stop. Refuel stop in Anchorage. And that was the first time I saw a 747. We were in jungle fatigues and the snow was about that high. Okay, And we got off and we looked up at 747 and we didn't think something that big could get off the ground. Okay, From there, we flew into um, Travis Air Force Base, and I was able to call my parents and say, I'm home, I've made it. And it was emotional uh, when I got home. My whole family was there, probably 20 people. Uh, it was a good celebration. Uh, no one in the terminal spit on my uniform. Nobody called me a baby killer in that terminal, okay? Um, people were fairly respectful. Uh, I do remember that I was glad to get out of Tyne Snoop. The base was being hit the day I left. Uh, I was glad to get home. After two and a half years, I'd, I'd had it. How much contact have you had with fellow veterans over the years? We kept in touch for about two or three years, the guys from Vietnam. Uh, after that, we sort of faded away. Uh, I guess we had our own lives to lead, families, marriages, divorces, kids, or whatever. But as you know, recently, um, in the past four or five years, I've been writing articles. Uh, for the newspapers called A Veteran's Story. I've interviewed over 300 veterans, and I am really back into the loop now. Uh, supporting veterans, being with veterans. Um, I've recently become the commander of the World War II 
Roundtable in Atlanta. It's a great organization, Coat and Tie Affair. Um, a member of the uh, Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, the Georgia Vietnam Veterans Association, the Golden Age Warriors. I'm on the board of directors for Honor Flight Conyers. I'm on the board of directors for the Walk of Heroes War Memorial, VFW, American Legion, and I somehow find time to write also. <laughs> Was it difficult readjusting to life after the war and after the military? Yes. Um, I didn't fit in. Uh, a lot of my high school buddies didn't serve. The ones that did, they could relate to me. We could talk about it. We could talk about the military, but we could not relate that to the guys we grew up with and went to high school with that did not go in. They had moved on and there was no way to relate to them. Um, it took me a long time, even going back to college, because I was older, a little bit more matured than most of the college students, and I, I felt like I just didn't fit in because their maturity level was just not there when it came to the military. I remember in an English class, for instance, there was a poem called Flight Line. It was about a B-29 flying fortress, super fortress, on a runway, and that's all the guy did. He just wrote about the flight line and that B-29 pulling out. And the college professor, the English professor, said, well, what is a B-29? And I said, well, that was a four-engine heavy bomber. That was a super fortress in World War II. It dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He went, no, 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 no. I said, well, what are you talking about? Okay. He said, that was a B-52 that dropped those bombs. I said, we didn't even have the B-52s in Korea. Okay, they came out about 55 or 56. He said, no, no, no propeller airplane couldn't carry that big bomb and we had an argument right there in the English class and that was the first time I got home. They said, well, how do you know so much? And I said, look, I, I, I love aviation. I know aviation. I just got back from being, oh, we got another baby killer in the room. That was the first time I had ever been called a baby killer and he and I got nose to nose. It took about four or five students to separate us. I just, uh, I blew it. <laughs> The, but by the way, readjusting, I partied heavy for about a month, nonstop. And one day on the way to meet some buddies, uh, I got about a mile from the house and my body just gave up. I had to pull over, lay down in my car, and I probably shook for about 20, 30 minutes. I don't know what happened, okay? And I went home, crawled in the bed and slept for about 24 hours. Hmm. And then after that, no reoccurrence. I don't know what happened, but. Is there any memory or experience from your service in Vietnam that has stayed with you through the years and had a lasting effect on your life? All my time in Southeast Asia has stayed with me and it's had a lasting effect because I feel that I am in a select group of people. We served, we did our job. We were not baby killers and we weren't heroes. We just did our job, we did what had to be done and that stuck with me, especially the way the Vietnam veterans were treated when we came home. Didn't like it at all. Our heroes are on a long black wall in Washington, D.C. And the heroes from World War II are in the numerous American cemeteries overseas and our national cemeteries, um, that Arlington National Cemeteries, uh, those are the heroes. And they're still coming home on the angel flight, if you know what the angel flight is. How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today? For those that know about it, for those that have read about it, uh, I know that I have spoken to the students at many schools. They don't even know where Vietnam is. They never heard of Saigon. They never heard, they don't even know where Laos and Cambodia. They don't know where Thailand is. They do not know that we lost 58,000 plus men and women over in Vietnam. Uh, to give you an example, it's just not Vietnam. We have a problem in all our schools. They are neglecting probably 50% of American history. And 50% of American history is our military. We have been involved in a lot of wars, war for independence, 
all the way to our expansion, all the way to World War II, Korea, Vietnam. To give you an example, I had a World War II veteran go to a school. He was going to make a presentation to a class. They changed classes on him. They wrote his name. We will use my name, Pete Mecca, WW, Roman numeral two, because there were Vietnam veterans and Korean veterans there too. He took this note down to the uh, one classroom, gave the note to the teacher. She said, well, thank you for coming. And she wrote the name up there. We'll say Pete Mecca, WW, Roman numeral two, and she said, class, we have a veteran here today. This is Pete Mecca. He's a veteran of World War XI. <laughs> when you have teachers who do not even understand World War Roman numeral II, then what are the students going to learn? Every school I have gone to and made a presentation, the kids sit there. I, I, I uh, did a presentation to a seventh grade class. And I thought, oh man, it's going to be hard to keep these kids' attention. They, they were quiet. They were respectful. They zeroed in on every word that I said. Some of them came up after the president, they shook my hand and everything else. And I, as I was leaving, one of the teachers came up, Mr. Mecca, Mr. Mecca. And there was a young boy with her, seventh grader. And she, and she said, he just wants to shake your hand. I said, well, sure, okay. And he shook my hand. He said, thank you. I've never met a real hero before. I felt about that big, <laughs> but it, it was nice, uh, but we really need to do a better job in our education. If you don't know history, you're going to repeat it. Uh, you've heard that all your life, and it's true. If you don't know, and if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're going to make them again. Did I get too much detail? And we there? have. <laughs> we have, yes, sir. Over and over. Uh, how did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about our veterans returning from combat today? What I see today makes me feel good. The returning veterans, or even if they're going overseas, on the way to the USO office or whatever, sometimes they can be walking down the, 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 the terminal, uh, the corridors in the terminal. What do you call them? Not, not, what's the word I'm looking for? Concourse, there you go. There you cut, go. Cut that. <laughs> you can see the soldiers, troops, walking down a concourse, and people stop and applaud them. Okay? They are coming back to good recognition, respect from what I've seen and everything I've heard and what they report to me, that our military is being treated with respect and dignity for what they do for us. And that did not happen to my generation. I'm glad for them. I'm proud of them. How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered today? Or is it? I don't even know if it is. Yes, the, the Vietnam Wall is there. We have the Vietnam Moving Wall coming to Rockdale County where I live. That's going to be a big affair. And we are doing that just not show, oh, go look at the names. Look, these guys died there. We use it as a tool for education. We want kids to know about Vietnam, and they want to learn. I recently found out in Macon, Georgia, much to my amazement, they actually have a class on Vietnam. They teach the Vietnam War, and there's more than the blood and guts of Vietnam. There's the politics, there's a the history, there's a the culture and things like that. Um, I, I just feel like that Vietnam still needs to be out there and talked about and studied and learned from. Um, I have been very proud of my generation. The guys are finally coming out and they are talking. Uh, they love now to get with each other and talk about Vietnam. We didn't do that when we first came home. So it's been a big change. Did you take away from Vietnam more that was positive and useful than you invested in blood, sweat, and tears? 50-50. Um, I came away, I went over there very optimistic, came home very pessimistic. Uh, after two and a half years of seeing how we were fighting the war, uh, I knew there was not going to be a good result. And that was discouraging. Um, was I changed? I guess, is that the question? Was I changed? No. Did you take away more that was positive and useful in your life? from that experience? From that experience, I would have to say it's from the military experience, and that is 
you accomplish more as a team. Uh, you can use team as together everybody accomplishes more. And I learned that the military is good and that's why I like kids to go in today. You learn how to say yes sir and no sir, but more important than anything else, you learn how to follow orders and then you learn how to lead. And that is extremely important. I, I came home with good feelings about that I had been trained properly, that I was a lot more mature than when I went overseas, but I was pessimistic about how it was being handled. In the end, what did Vietnam mean to you and your generation? Vietnam hurt. Uh, our generation was not treated well coming back. Uh, as I have said before, um, I don't really know where to go with that, to tell you the truth. I, I was really disappointed in my country uh, after Vietnam. Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? About four or five times. What are your impressions when you visit there? I touch names that I knew, but also I have, uh, I have gone up there each time with the honor flight, either as a guardian or as a, a board member. It's surprising how many World War II veterans will go over and touch a name and his name is their son. Okay, is their nephew or something like that. So it's emotional. Um, it's easier every time I go. The first time I even had trouble approaching it, but it's a great memorial. I was actually up there for Veterans Day. Um, the History Channel flew four plane loads of Vietnam veterans from different cities, and Atlanta was one of them, for a um, Veterans Day event um, it was it was marvelous. It, it, there were about fifty thousand of us there, and some guy named Joe Galloway was our guest speaker, <laughs> who is interviewing me today. And you did a marvelous job, sir. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Have you heard about the fiftieth anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration? Absolutely. What are your thoughts about this effort? I like it. Uh, we need to recognize the sacrifices of our men and women overseas, and especially Vietnam. Uh, this Wednesday, I'm the keynote speaker at an event at our church. Uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution are reading a presidential proclamation recognizing the end of the Vietnam War, the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. Um, then I'm gonna make a little speech and then we're gonna have some food and fellowship. But I think it's important, maybe, maybe the 50th and the 40th anniversary could be a proper closure for a lot of guys. The ones that are left, I think we need that. And there's not that many of us left anymore. Do you know that? We are below a million now. The one, boots on the ground, we are down to about 750,000, okay? Hard to believe. Well, World War II, we had about 16, 17 million people in uniform and they're down to about two million, okay? Vietnam, we had 2.7 million boots on the ground, not Vietnam era, but boots on the ground, and we're down to about 750,000. Mathematically, the World War II veterans could outlive the Vietnam veterans, but it probably won't happen. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mecca, we appreciate your service. Thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for your support. You bet. Now, give me 15 minutes.